Yeah, I like I like for uh, students to be able to see exactly what's going on in their head um, because it would just make more sense to you. Yeah, even if you're taking your test, or not only just taking your test, but as you're taking care of your patients, uh, you can visualize what's actually going on. Right, you get that mental uh, picture, if you will. All right, so the last one, uh, which, which we won't go into much, uh, it talks about high uh, output failure. Uh, this is uh, not, um, it's, it's pretty uncommon. So, but basically it's when uh, there's a high cardiac output. There are certain conditions um, uh, that we call a uh, hyperkinetic conditions uh, that causes high output uh, failure. And um, uh, conditions like septicemia, uh, high fevers, anemia, and hyperthyroidism. Um, and this is because uh, there's an increased metabolic needs. And when there's an increased metabolic needs, things just go into kind of a hyper, hyper uh, kind of uh, activity. So, but don't worry so much about uh, that particular one. We uh, rarely uh, see it, but I want you to be aware of it at least. Oh, you know what? I don't, I'm not sharing. Uh, sorry about that. Some of this I kind of uh, duplicated, so. All right, so sometimes I get a, a bit ahead of myself. It's the way they kind of constructed these uh, PowerPoints, which I know I, I need to really go back in and uh, redo some of them. Um, so the beautiful thing about it is that we've already discussed this one. Uh, the left-sided heart failure we discussed. Uh, we also discussed the uh, right-sided heart failure. Um, I told you guys that uh, right side of heart failure can be caused by the left side failing first, uh, as far as well as right ventricular MI, as well as pulmonary hypertension. Um, uh, and basically what happens is the right ventricle cannot uh, completely uh, empty. And so the volume increases and the pressure develops in the uh, venous system. Um, and then these patients develop uh, peripheral edema, sometimes the pitting type of peripheral edema. Uh, peripheral edema, when it's pitting, if you take a finger and you press into the lower extremity when it's swollen like that, that indentation stays for a certain period of time. Depending on how long it stays would depend on how we grade them. And I believe we grade them uh, from one to four. The higher the number, the more severe, the, the, um, the pitting edema, all right? So if you press into that uh, swelling, uh, swell, uh, uh, that edematous tissue, and it comes back up and let's say a matter of a, maybe a few seconds, it's probably a one. But if you uh, put an indentation in it with your finger and it takes, let's say, uh, several minutes to, um, to uh, uh, return to its normal shape, um, then it's more of a severe form, all right? Uh, these patients uh, with right side of heart failure can also have hepato, hepatomegaly. And what that is is hepato meaning liver and, uh, and megaly meaning enlarged. So the liver becomes enlarged, it becomes engorged. Why is it engorged? Because all that blood is now backing up from the right side of the heart back into the venous circulation. Remember when blood was returning to the left, excuse me, to the right side of the heart, it went through all these different organs through by way of the venous system, including the GI system, the spleen, uh, the liver, and so forth. And so it goes, uh, it, it is traveling, it's on its way back to the right side of the heart. But when it's backing up, uh, and in particular, the uh, let's say the liver, it will become more enlarged, hepatomegaly becomes enlarged because it's becoming more engorged. And then you begin to see 
uh, different uh, signs or symptoms of liver failure as well. Uh, these patients also have distended jugular veins or what we call JBD. Um, and it's when the jugular veins are distended. Why? Because that blood is backing up on the right side. And so, you know, it's backing up into the superior, superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, but in particular, the superior vena cava causes the uh, jugular veins to distend because of all that fluid is backing up. Uh, these patients will also have uh, increased LFTs. LFTs, F as in, excuse me, L as in Larry, F as in Frank, T as in Tom. Liver enzymes, that's what, how we abbreviate it. And so um, those LFTs are, are increased. Why? The liver is engorged. All that fluid is backing up, right? They also have anorexia. Or uh, this is another GI symptom, anorexia. Um, does anyone not know what anorexia is? Anyone? Don't be ashamed. Obviously, you can look it up when, uh, well, I'll tell you, but it's uh, uh, when people basically lose a desire to eat, uh, right? Kind of in simple terms. And, and, and again, that's because all this, all this blood is backing up on the right side and into the GI system, which becomes edematous. And all that space is being taken up because of all of that swelling. And so you feel you have, the, you have what we call early satiety. Satiety um, when they get full quickly. All right, so does that make sense to you guys? So as you can see, the symptoms on the left side, heart failure would be more pulmonary, shortness of breath, crackles in the lungs, uh, pink frothy sputum, uh, shortness, well I said shortness of breath, increased respiratory uh, rate and so forth. Cause it's backing up into the uh, pulmonary veins and into the pulmonary uh, system. It's vasculature, right? In the right side, you'll begin to see the symptoms I just uh, mentioned here because it's uh, backing up into the, um, the venous circulation. Uh, any, any questions, anyone, so far? And please don't be afraid to ask. Anyone? Going once, going twice. All right. So move on. Uh, we talked about this one already. See, told you I get ahead of myself. Um, rare, uh, a rare uh, uh, occurrence, a uh, high output failure because these conditions actually cause the heart rate to increase uh, a lot. And so when the, heart, when the heart beats really fast, you're getting, um, it, it's trying to um, increase the cardiac output. But now if it's beating too fast, that means it's in systole a lot and not in diastole uh, as, like, as much as it should be. And therefore, if it's not in diastole as much, then you're not filling up your ventricles. If you're not filling up your ventricles, your cardiac output is going to be poor. If you're not filling up your ventricles or if the heart is damaged or impaired for whatever reason, your ejection fraction, the amount or the, the percentage of blood leaving the left ventricle is impaired. That stroke volume uh, the amount of blood leaving the heart with each beat is impaired because the myocardium is impaired. That heart muscle is impaired. So when you're thinking about the stroke volume, uh, cardiac output, um, what's the other one? Stroke volume, cardiac output, ejection fraction. 
you think about all those, I want you to know what those are. All right, remember cardiac output? Uh, it takes about one minute for the blood to, um, uh, to go through the circulatory system. One minute, uh, one whole minute. Uh, stroke volume, each beat, the amount of blood leaving the uh, left ventricle is your stroke volume. Your ejection fraction, the percentage of blood. If it's 100 cc's and 50% uh, is ejected, your ejection fraction is 50%. But in order to maintain adequate perfusion to your, your organs and tissues, you need at least about 55% or greater. Any questions? Now we're getting ready to get into the nitty gritty. Uh, so this is a part that I kind of have to spend, we'll see what time is it? So at least I'll be able to get this in before the next break, hopefully. All right, so uh, I would imagine you all know what a compensatory mechanism is or just when the, when the body uh, has a way of compensating when its normal functioning is not uh, happening. So normally um, we have a certain uh, cardiac, cardiac output, which is about five liters, I believe, um, that would circulate in that, car in that circulatory system, it's about five liters. Um, if that is impaired for whatever reason, uh, a compensatory mechanism would kick in in order to try to get that cardiac output back to where it should be. So your body does that. Uh, your body does several things when it detects there might be poor, a poor cardiac output. It had, uh, these, uh, these compensatory mechanisms uh, will uh, kick in in order to achieve uh, the cardiac output. So when the cardiac output is insufficient uh, to meet uh, the body's uh, demands, the body demands a certain amount of oxygen, a certain amount of nutrients and so forth, uh, these mechanisms which we would discuss uh, operate uh, in order to increase the cardiac output. Does that make sense? Does that not make sense to anyone? All right. Uh, so uh, some of those uh, compensatory mechanisms are the SNS stimulation or sympathetic nervous system. The other one is the renin angiotensin system activation. The other one is the chemical responses, uh, BNP and myocardial hypertrophy. Now, um, typically when the body, uh, when our organs and tissues do not receive uh, adequate uh, cardiac output, one of the uh, compensatory mechanisms uh, will occur, such as the release of catecholamines, you know, your epinephrine, norepinephrine. This is what gives us that fight or flight uh, response. It causes uh, this general physiological changes that prepare the body for physical activity. You may have to fight or you may have to run. Fight, stay in fight or run. So uh, these catecholamines, they cause this hyperactive response, you know, so uh, because you, you need the heart to beat faster when your activity increases because your heart is now requiring more oxygen, more nutrients because it's in that hyper response, all right? Um, so some of the typical effects of uh, uh, catecholamines when they're released is the patients will have an increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, the glucose levels uh, will also increase. Uh, and this is again, a general reaction to uh, the sympathetic nervous system, all right? Which is a part of the autonomic nervous system. Remember you have the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. And I would like for you guys, I, actually I provided some information for you. Uh, when you look at the sympathetic nervous system, just think about things uh, being more hyper responsive. When you're thinking about the parasympathetic nervous system, it has an opposite response. So the sympathetic response is more hyper hyper, 
the parasympathetic brings it down to more normal, more calm uh, levels. Because you can't stay in that sympathetic response forever because if you do, your heart rate is always increased, your blood pressure is always increased, you're, uh, you're spilling over all this glucose into your, uh, uh, your bloodstream, and you can't stay in that uh, state forever. It may be all right in fight or flight, but once flight, fight or flight is over, everything has to go back and, and allow the parasympathetic nervous system to take control. But these particular mechanisms, uh, compensatory mechanisms, occur when there is an insufficient amount of cardiac output because of a failed heart. All right? The heart is already sick. All right? And so uh, these compensatory mechanisms can increase the cardiac output momentarily, uh, but it does have uh, very damaging effects on the myocardium. And we have to, and this is when we have to give drugs to lower uh, these activities. And I'll show you how we do that. So let's talk about the first one, uh, sympathetic uh, nervous system stimulation. As I mentioned to you, um, well, when we talk about the sympathetic uh, nervous system stimulation, we're talking about uh, catecholamines, as I mentioned here. Uh, and of course, I showed you how it affects the body. Um, and so uh, these catecholamines are actually dumped into our uh, system. And uh, this happens uh, when our tissues are deprived of oxygen. Uh, and so remember, uh, because, because uh, the heart is uh, poorly uh, pumping, uh, oxygen cannot get to our tissues, uh, vital uh, organs and whatnot. And so this dumping of catecholamines, uh, this, um, uh, uh, these are hormones, if you will, that causes such a hyper response uh, that dumped into our system and it brings about this immediate response. It's very, it's really fast, all right? And so what happens is you have these receptors that are located on the heart and these receptors that are located on the uh, smooth muscle walls of the, of the arteries. When catecholamines are dumped into our system, the catecholamines will attach to those receptors on the heart, causing the heart rate to what? Increase, all right? Those catecholamines, when they're released, they will also attach to those receptors on the smooth muscle of your arteries. And so when it attaches to the receptors on the heart, it causes the heart rate to do what? To increase. So you go from 80 beats per minute to, well, let's say 40 beats per minute to now about 130 beats per minute. That's what the catecholamines are doing. And when the, when the catecholamines attaches to the smooth muscle on the arteries, it causes the arteries to do what? To constrict. Because when, you're, when your arteries constrict to a certain point, uh, your tissues are perfused better. It's the difference between your, arter, your arteries dilating like this, meaning you have hypotension, meaning you're not getting adequate blood flow to your tissues and organs, to giving a drug to cause them to constrict a little more, now you're getting better perfusion. When the catecholamines are released in this regard, it causes vasoconstriction, too much vasoconstriction. So you have a failing heart, and now you have an increased heart rate because of those catecholamines. The heart cannot deal with such a fast heart rate. It's already sick. You're in heart failure. You have, you're, you're in, you're in, uh, you're in uh, pump failure. It cannot um, withstand that much work. The work load, the workload of the heart has now increased because that those catecholamines has stimulated the receptors located on the heart 
and causing the heart to beat very fast. No good for a failing heart. Now it's causing your, uh, uh, your smooth muscles of your arteries to constrict, meaning your afterload is now increased. Do you want an increased afterload in heart failure patients? You don't. Because when the arterial system is constricted like that and that failing heart has to pump against all that pressure, it, it begins to fail slowly over a period of time. And so you, that, this is something you do not want. And so again, as I said, there, there's, you have these uh, adrenergic uh, receptors that are located on the heart that will cause an increase in your heart rate. You also have these, um, um, well, yeah, the adrenergic receptors are located on the heart. And so they cause heart rate to increase. And you have these uh, uh, alpha adrenergic receptors that are located on the smooth, uh, the smooth uh, wall uh, portion of the uh, arteries and whatnot. And that causes the, uh, the blood vessels to constrict, thereby increasing your blood pressure. This is something you do not want. Uh, this will cause an increase in your cardiac output and your stroke volume momentarily. Why? Because now your heart rate is increased because of these catecholamines. Uh, this increase in your heart rate is limited in compensating uh, for a low cardiac output. It's not going to last long, but it is damaging to the heart. Because what happens is when the heart rate is increased, uh, when you have a very fast heart rate, again, as I mentioned, your ventricular filling time is reduced. So that diastole is not occurring uh, long enough for when blood, uh, uh, when the left atrium receives blood, and so the left, the left ventricle is not resting long enough to receive its blood so that it can have a good cardiac output, a good stroke volume, a good ejection fraction, all right? So it's not resting long enough for that. You need adequate systole, you need adequate diastole. When the heart rate is increased because of the catecholamines, you're not going to, you're going to get decreased filling time. And so the amount or the volume is decreased. And therefore, your cardiac output will uh, begin to do what? Will begin to fail. And when your cardiac output fails, your tissues and your organs are deprived of its oxygen and nutrients. And you start running into problems. Um, so when the, heart rate, when the heart rate is increased, uh, the heart needs some more oxygen. So the demand is up. And so a, a heart that is poorly perfused, let's say due to arterial uh, atherosclerosis, you know, the, the plaque buildup and, and whatnot that causes even more obstruction of the arteries, uh, it actually can worsen or it can make your heart failure even uh, more worse. All right, so what we have to do in these cases is we have to get what we call, let's say a beta blocker. This is one of the medications that you'll see such as like uh, low pressure, uh, any of the other uh, laws, the LOL endings. Uh, and what those drugs do is those receptors that are located on the heart and on the blood vessels, um, they block those receptors. And so the catecholamines cannot stimulate those receptors. And if the catecholamines cannot stimulate those receptors, your heart rate comes down. Your, your, um, your blood vessels, they dilate more because you're blocking those receptors, all right? You have, to, you have to block those receptors from the catecholamines. And this is why we call them beta blockers. So we get the opposite effect of, the, of that compensatory mechanism. And this is because you want the heart to not have to pump against a whole lot of pressure. You don't want the heart to have to work too hard because again, you have a sick heart. 
Um, all right, so so I want you guys to look to look at your sympathetic uh, nervous system as well as your parasympathetic. And I did uh, outline what actually happens uh, when the sympathetic stimulation occurs versus the parasympathetic, and they're just opposite. If you learn one, then you know the other. All right, so uh, does any, can anyone explain to me um, the next uh, compensatory mechanism? And again, all this is happening because the oxygen uh, is, well, our tissues and organs are deprived of oxygen and nutrients due to um, a decreased cardiac output because the heart has failed, it's failing as a pump. So can anyone explain to me uh, the renin-angiotensin uh, system activation? Don't know if you all have this in your previous term. Should have had it in pharmacology though. Especially when you're talking about your ACE inhibitors, your ARBs. Anybody brave enough to take this on? Is it like the brain synthesis into the kidneys? Go on. Or like it's holding um, sodium and water, so basically the fluids, and it increases the preload. Yep. It does. Uh, we usually have to give um, the ACE inhibitors for that. All right, good, good. Um, and so what she's saying is, when the, when, when the kidneys, all right, so when the heart is failing as a pump, so you have decreased cardiac output, which means you have decreased perfusion, right? You have decreased perfusion, that means that your vital organs are not being perfused, as I mentioned. So your kidneys are not being perfused. When your kidneys detect poor perfusion, this compensatory mechanism will kick in because the kidneys are saying, hey, I need more volume. Where's the volume? So the kidneys are saying, I'm going to do something in order to increase the volume. So when the RAS system, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system uh, kicks in, it will cause the kidney tubules to hold on to sodium. And wherever sodium goes, what follows? Water. Water. Water, Water follows. So when, the, when this RAS system, RAS, RAS system kicks in, Sodium is retained, water follows. Now your volume, your intravascular volume is what? Increased. And when your intravascular volume is increased, your preload is what? Increase or decreased? Increased. It's increased because you got all this volume on board now. Wherever sodium goes, uh, water goes. So now you have all this volume in your vascular system. So all this volume has to go back to the, what? The right side of the heart. And when a heart is sick, can it handle all that extra volume? No. All right, so sodium and water is retained. And when sodium and water is retained, you're actually kicking out potassium. All right. And also what happens with this, uh, with the angiotin or the, the RAS system is that vasoconstriction occurs. So now your, your, uh, uh, your arterial system is clamping down, is constricting, because you're trying to increase your blood pressure to get better perfusion to its organs, all right? And so this is what, this is what happens when the kidneys are getting less perfusion. The RAS system kicks in, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system kicks in, Sodium and water is retained. The vascular system is constricted. So your blood pressure increases and you have more volume. It's the, it's the kidney's way of saying, give me more volume. It does this in, a, in an effort to get better volume. But this is no good for your heart. 
is not only does your heart has to pump against all that pressure, but it also has to um, manage all that volume, all that all the volume that is taken on board now. And this is the reason why we give ACE inhibitors, because ACE inhibitors stop that process at some point. It prevents it from uh, from uh, progressing from the renin to the uh, angiotensin to the aldosterone system or process. If it can stop that, then the kidney tubules will excrete sodium and water instead. It's the opposite, actually. So you're excreting sodium, and wherever sodium goes, water goes. So you're excreting sodium and water. When you give an ACE inhibitor, you're excreting sodium and water, but now you're holding on to potassium. So with these patients um, who are taking ACE inhibitors, you have to watch out for, just like with spirolactone, you have to watch out for hyperkalemia. All right. Uh, with this, uh, so uh, so with the renal and the, the rod system, um, again, so you have this decreased perfusion to the kidneys due to a poor pump. Uh, so this activation of the ROS, so uh, angio, uh, the, renin, uh, the renin system will lead to angiotensin 1 and then angiotensin 2 and then to aldosterone secretion. It is the aldosterone part, part, part of this, um, uh, this compensatory mechanism that causes us to hold on to sodium and water, hence um, fluid retention. All right. And so again, this increases your preload. Uh, it also causes your, this vasoconstriction, which means your afterload is now increased or elevated. And so that angiotensin II also leads to uh, ventricular remodeling. What that means is the, the ventricles, they change. Those myocytes that we talked about, when, you, when you're born normally, those myocytes or the cells of the heart if you're born normal, put it that way, they're normal. And so when the myocytes are normal, they do what? They contract normally. But because of all this pressure and because of the fact that this angiotensin II is now changing those cells, those cells are not able to squeeze normally as a pump. The angiotensin II is changing um, those cells of the myocardium. All that pressure is also changing those cells. So you get this thickened cells, of this, this, thickened, uh, this thickened tissue rather. So the, so the myocardium on the, le the left ventricle gets even larger. You know, the left ventricle is already large. It's larger than the, than the right side because it has to perfuse uh, the systemic circulation. But when this happens, it becomes even more larger, which is a, actually another compensatory mechanism that we've discussed called myocardial hypertrophy. We'll talk about that. But for now, um, in, in this particular case, there's ventricular uh, remodeling. And so uh, there's progressive uh, myocyte uh, contractile dysfunction over a period of time. So the contractile force you get from a normal myocytes or cells of the, um, uh, the, heart, the heart muscle begins to lose its um, capacity to squeeze. All right. Now, uh, other conditions can also lead to ventricular remodeling, but I won't hit those uh, for now. Uh, just go ahead and read that in my notes. Uh, be aware of that. Uh, let's see, so. So we also, uh, so that's the renin-angiotensin uh, mechanism uh, that I just discussed. Uh, does that not make sense to anyone? Yeah, this stuff can blow your mind. So that's why I'm trying to do it a little slower. Uh, so forgive me, I'm just trying to make sure everyone uh, gets it. Um, so the next uh, 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 um, uh, compensatory mechanism is the chemical response BNP. Now I want you to, re you to remember this. 
with B with with the heart failure patients, we always want to know what your BNP your BNP is. So your BNP is a, uh, a natri natriuretic uh, peptide, uh, and they're basically neurohormones uh, that works to promote uh, vasodilation. All right. So this is just a compensatory mechanism. So you want some vasodilation. You know, you don't want vasoconstriction. You want vasodilation. Uh, it also causes uh, diuresis uh, in, in a way of it causes sodium loss. And of course, again, when there's sodium loss, there's fluid loss. So your body would do this also to try to get rid of its fluid and to also open up its uh, blood vessel. And so when patients have a very high BNP level, sometimes they're well over a thousand. Uh, can't think of the range right now. I want you to look up the range but it's not that high, so I don't think it's usually more than 100, I believe. Um, but sometimes we see it in the thousands. And when you take the BNP lab as, uh, in, uh, into consideration, along with, um, God darn. Um, when we take the BNP into consideration, along with um, the history of the patient, your assessment and whatnot, uh, because there, there are other conditions that will cause the BNP level state to rise. But when you have a high BNP, you have the patient of pulmonary edema, uh, you have swelling, uh, you have uh, crackles in the, in the lungs. Uh, in other words, that clinical picture that you read about as far as a heart, heart failure patient, you take those labs and all these symptoms into consideration that your patient is likely at heart failure. Because sometimes these numbers, uh, the BNP can be really high due to other conditions. Uh, but the patient is not really at heart failure. So you have to look at everything. The, the history, uh, the, sim uh, the, the signs and symptoms, in other words, your assessment and whatnot, as well as the BNP. Um, and so in CHF, your BNP uh, is produced and released uh, by the ventricles uh, when the patient has fluid overload. When those ventricles are stretching, it will release uh, this BNP, this neurohormone. Again, due to the ventricles being overloaded. Now the BNP can also be high uh, in patients who have advanced age or older folks. Also, it can be high in poor renal functioning. Um, and also, well, in patients who are obese, the BNP levels can be pretty low. So I, I don't want you to get caught up in, in the fact that when you see a high BNP, oh, the patient is automatically in heart failure. It can be high in other uh, conditions as well, or as well as advanced age. So um, an astute clinician will look at a variety of things, even a chest x-ray. Chest x-ray can be revealing, can show a lot of fluid on the lungs. All right, and also they can do uh, different tests like an echocardiogram. An echocardiogram can determine if the left ventricle is, is, um, is failing, it can look at the valves. It can also determine your ejection fraction. So all these tools, your assessment, uh, everything, it, it basically tells us what's going on with this patient. Now let's get to this other one. Uh, this is myocardial uh, hypertrophy. Um, and this is an enlargement, enlargement of the myocardium uh, with, the, with or without uh, that chamber, uh, the ventricular chambers uh, dilating. And again, this is another compensatory mechanism. So uh, what happens here, uh, the walls of the, of the heart uh, thickens uh, in order to create uh, more cardiac mass. So when, when the afterload is high and the ventricles have to, has the ventricle, the ventricles uh, have to pump against all that pressure, it's working very hard. And so the muscles of the heart will increase in size, hypertrophy. The tissues are increasing in size. You think about if you were to take a dumbbell and you were to lift a dumbbell, it increases the size of your muscle in your, tri in your triceps, your quads, your um, hamstrings, and uh, you know, you know, your peripheral um, uh, muscles. So same thing with the heart. When the heart has to work really hard, it increases in size, all right? All right, so it increases in size. And this is a compensatory mechanism. 
if I make the heart muscle of the left ventricle in particular larger, it'll be stronger and it, it does become stronger, but it's still a not, it's not, it's not a good, um, uh, this, uh, there's this response to high pressure. It's, it's not good for the heart. Uh, the heart should maintain its normal size and function and whatnot, but when it, uh, increases and I'll, I'll, I'll draw a picture for you so you can actually see what's happening. So um, you do get an improved cardiac output because of this increased size in that muscle. It does improve. Uh, however, the cardiac muscle, uh, it gets thick and it grows faster than the collateral circulation uh, can develop to supply it with uh, oxygen. And so when the collateral circulation cannot keep up, then the heart muscle, that enlarged heart muscle becomes deprived. All right, so let me show you what I mean by that. Um, let's see. Dr. Weaver. Yes, sir. Um, question. Uh, yes. In these, um, I found on Mayo that 100 is a normal range. But is there? You, you, said, uh, you said what's what's 100? Because, like, you know you how you have um, sodium is 135 to 145. What's the BNPs range? You know, uh, that's what I was telling you guys. I didn't know right off, but I, let's see. Let, let's look it up. Uh, let's see. Normal BNP. Who's going to get there before me? Not that fast of a typer. Uh, so it's less than 100. I knew it wasn't long, but uh, it can be an indication of heart failure. Again, not all the time, but in this case, if it's less than 100, it still doesn't necessarily mean you're not in heart failure. You could be just in the early phase of it. All right, so that's your range on your BNP. That answer your question? Yes. Sir. All right, so it's just another, another tool that we use. Uh, to determine if a patient is in heart failure. So let me show you guys uh, what I mean by uh, the problem that these patients have with um, with uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh oh, let me share this. Uh, all right, so I have a, a blank uh, canvas here. Let's see, so, so let's say uh, this is the heart. And y'all, again, forgive me, I know. All right, so I told you all that the right ventricle, that's not what I want. So, the right ventricle has a myocardium, let's say this thick, because it just has to pump blood into the pulmonary circulation. So it doesn't have to be too thick. It's not pumping against a lot of pressure. So it doesn't require it to be too thick. Now on the, on the left side, it is going to be a little thicker. Why? Because it has to pump blood into the systemic circulation as one of the uh, other students mentioned. So this is your size now. Uh, when the heart is normally this size, it's getting, a, uh, it's getting supplied with um, a certain amount of, uh, of uh, blood from the uh, arterial system. When the tissue, uh, when the tissue grows in size, even greater than that, because it has to work really hard against all that pressure, this left ventricle has to pump against a lot of pressure. So this myocardium becomes more thick. If the myocardium has to become more thick, it's going to require some additional blood. And so we call that collateral circulation. And let's say as it, as it grows, let's say this, um, let's see, this signifies 
Uh, these lines just signifies some additional blood vessels that have developed, which is collateral circulation. The size of this myocardium on the left side is increasing so fast that this cannot keep up. So you have like, let's say three collateral um, uh, uh, blood vessels to this big muscle now that's, that has increased in size. It has increased, it has gone from this size to now this size. See how it, it has increased because of the workload of the left ventricle? And so that collateral circulation cannot keep up with this. And if it cannot keep up with this, then you're getting less oxygen to this thickened um, myocardium. This thickness is called ventricular hypertrophy. It grows in size because the tissue is growing in size because you're trying to become bigger to overcome all that afterload, all that pressure. And so this is again, another compensatory mechanism, uh, myocardial hypertrophy. Anyone does not understand that particular, um, that particular um, compensatory mechanism. All right, uh, let's, let's see where we are. Um, <clears throat> All right, so we, we talked about uh, the different uh, compensatory mechanisms. Hopefully you guys understand them well. It is, a, it is a, as far as a recap, it is a result of your tissues and organs not receiving its or enough um, oxygen and nutrients and so forth uh, because the heart has failed as a pump. And in order to uh, make up for this cardiac uh, output, poor cardiac output because of the failing pump, you will begin to have these compensatory mechanisms kick in in order to increase the cardiac output. Questions? Come back at 1.15, please.
All right, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and give it. Um, I guess another minute. Uh, so, how is everyone doing so far with this information? Good. It's a lot. Yeah. Do you find it uh, too difficult? It's just the information. I don't necessarily feel it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the beauty I of it is listening to the lectures again, um, like right before I go to bed. Yeah. And that tends to help as well. Because my house is quieter, um, you know, my child is asleep, so I can really listen again. Exactly. Exactly. You know what? While you're doing dishes, washing clothes, uh, you know, maybe at the doctor's office, wherever you are, you can listen to the, the voiceovers. Use your time wisely. You know, while you're lying in bed, you know, uh, maybe, maybe I'll put you to sleep. They said my voice put people to sleep. I don't know if that's a good thing, but, you know, you can, you know, whatever you're doing, you know, heck, if I go to the, you know, kind of too much information, but if I go to the bathroom, you know, I'll take something with me to read. So, um, that's, that's just to get get the point over uh, to you all that uh, you have to use just as many moments of your awakening uh, times to get this information in. And fortunately, see, like back in my day, they'll give that lecture and you try to write as fast as you can. And that was the extent of it, right? In this day and time with the, with the technology, you know, I can, I'm recording this lecture and then, um, you know, you can play it again and again and again. So you do have that as an advantage uh, to you. So take advantage of it. Um, this whole uh, lecture uh, period will be on your, in your modules. I may remove the other one and just keep this one. So, you know, just because you guys were in this particular class, so you can identify, I guess, uh, better uh, with it. Um, and I think as I go, as I go through, uh, these lectures, uh, I think I, uh, improve more and more. Uh, so you, you certainly want the more improved and latest and greatest, but then I guess that depends on how you feel that day too. Right now with this eye bothering me, it kind of, it's a bit aggravating, but, um, you know, anyway. All right. So, uh, without further uh, delay, uh, all right, so look at look at the etiology here. I, I did tell you that systemic hypertension, the clamping of the arterial system is clamped, is constricted. And this is what leads to most cases of heart failure. The, the left ventricle has to, has to pump against all that pressure, right? Um, about one third of patients exper experiencing uh, an MI can also develop a heart failure. And again, this is because uh, that blood flow is impaired to the myocardium. And so remember those myocytes, which is the cells of the heart, they become deprived of oxygen and they lose their function. This is how uh, our cells continue to function well. They, they function well because they're receiving oxygen, they're receiving nutrients. When they don't, as in the case of an MI or even CAD, coronary artery disease, they're getting less blood flow to those tissues and therefore that part of the heart begins to fail. All right, uh, there's also structural uh, heart changes. Uh, think about the valve dysfunction. Remember I talked about the pulmonic valve, the aortic uh, stenosis, uh, which also causes uh, pressure and volume overload in the heart. So, you know, when you, when you guys begin to think about uh, these valve disorders, let's say we may talk about aortic uh, stenosis. We won't have time in class, but I did do a voiceover on that. Um, you don't have to think about a whole lot uh, when it comes to aortic stenosis in terms of symptoms, because eventually you're going to see heart failure symptoms with these valvular disorders. Because if, the aortic, if aortic stenosis is severe enough, and you're not getting enough blood through that valve, you're going to develop heart failure symptoms at some point. So we've already gone over heart failure, what we're going over now. We've gone over quite a bit of it. And so you know if a patient is diagnosed with aortic stenosis, 
you're going to see heart failure symptoms. All right. Um, same, same with on the right side of the heart. If that patient has a pulmonic uh, stenosis, if that pulmonary artery, that valve is stenosed, you're going to see right ventricular failure and all those symptoms that goes along with it, that venous congestion, or on the left side, that pulmonary congestion. So begin to think about it in those terms. Don't make it so confusing, all right? It's all connected. One thing leads to another. It's the domino effect, if you will, all right? So I want you to look at uh, table 35-1 when you get time on page 694. Uh, for additional um, direct causes and risk of factors for heart failure. So look at that. Uh, and as mentioned, uh, right heart failure typically occurs from problems such as COPD, because with COPD, the structure of your uh, pulmonary system, the vascular system is changed. All right, pulmonary hypertension, remember the vasculature in the pulmonary system is changed. It's, uh, it's more constricted. And also ARDS, so A-R-D, A-R-D-S. Um, that's the um, acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome, I believe. And again, with this particular condition, this is when the AC membranes are thickened. They become thickened with a lot of edema and swelling, and then you don't get adequate gas exchange. This is what a lot of your, um, what do you call it, your, um, this is what a lot of your COVID-19 patients are dealing with. When they have the COVID pneumonia and you have to place them on ventilators, they're going into ARDS, you know, and you can't, whenever that AC membrane, the alveolar capillary membrane is thickened, you don't get good gas exchanges. And so eventually these patients can die. Uh, many years ago, uh, when I worked at a hospital in the ICU and we saw, uh, Patients and patients who were uh, in arts, um, they had a very poor pro prognosis. Uh, they didn't live long. Uh, they didn't make it. Um, and so, what we uh, try to do is that we try to decrease the amount of uh, volume or the amount of fluids of swelling in the AC membrane. The AC membrane with the oxygen and the CO2 exchange places. Uh, Uh, because many uh, uh, conditions can lead to heart failure, uh, it is important uh, to ask the right uh, questions uh, when you're talking uh, to your patients trying to obtain a patient history. Uh, so you want to ask about their past medical uh, history, uh, such as, do you have hypertension? Do you have angina or cardiac pain? Because cardiac pain can be due to, these patients may have coronary artery disease, you're not getting blood flow, uh, not blood flow, past a certain point of obstruction in that coronary artery, and you have chest pain, all right? They can have an, uh, have it, ask them, have they ever had an MI? Again, destruction to the myocardial muscle, uh, therefore, leads to heart failure. Uh, rheumatic heart disease, which can affect the heart, uh, the heart valves. Uh, valvular disorders, uh, aortic stenosis, um, pulmonic valve stenosis, uh, aortic uh, or mitral regurge, tricuspid regurge. Um, you think about your regurge, in other words, blood is going up, but it's flowing back because the valves are incompetent. Endocarditis, uh, pericarditis. Um, you wanna ask uh, patients about their perception of their activity uh, tolerance, uh, such as ask them about their breathing patterns. Uh, about their sleeping patterns. Are they up all, all night because of difficulty breathing? What about their uh, urinary patterns? Sometimes with CHF, patients have a uh, nocturnal, um, um, uh, well, where they're getting up uh, throughout the night having to pee. Um, ask them about their fluid volume status. Uh, you wanna know um, uh, what is their knowledge? Uh, are there any knowledge deficits, uh, knowledge gaps uh, with respect to heart failure? So uh, teaching, teaching when it, uh, when, as it relates to uh, heart failure is very important. And this is why I'm coming to you 
teaching you this information the way I am uh, because you're going to be the teachers. The doctors do not stay in these rooms long enough uh, to teach these patients. They're in, they're out. You spend 24 seven with these patients, not you in particular, but just nursing. And so we have to, we have to teach our patients so that they can better manage their disease. Better disease self-management results in less acute hospitalizations. And so, uh, so your signs and symptoms of your heart failure, it will depend on the type of heart failure, uh, the ventricle involved, especially if it's the left ventricle, uh, you have uh, even more significant symptoms and whatever the underlying cause is. <clears throat> Um, all right, so, so I want you to look at uh, these left-sided uh, symptoms of, uh, well, left-sided heart failure, the weakness, fatigue, dizziness, acute confusion. Why acute confusion? Low blood flow to the brain. The heart is not pumping well. Pulmonary congestions, blood is backing up. Let me go back up. Weakness, you're not getting perfusion to your muscles. So you have weakness, you have fatigue, you're not getting perfused to your uh, peripheral um, musculoskeletal system. Dizziness, not getting adequate uh, perfusion to your heart, to your brain. <laughs> Confusion, same thing. You're not perfusing your brain properly. Pulmonary congestion, the pulmonary system is not being perfused, uh, or rather blood is backing up into the pulmonary system. Uh, breathlessness, uh, remember the pulmonary side is, was, is are the symptoms that you will see uh, with left-sided side, heart failure. Oliguria, uh, less than 400 cc's in, uh, I believe, a 24-hour uh, period of urine. Uh, you're not perfusing your kidneys, so you'll have a decreased urine output. You'll also hear S3 and S4 gallop. Uh, S3, um, one of them is like you hear like a Tennessee, uh, and the other one you'll hear like Kentucky. I think Kentucky is S3. It'll sound like that when you auscultate breath, uh, lung, uh, heart sounds you hear Kentucky uh, or Tennessee or something like that. Um, you'll learn that in, in health assessment. But your S3 and your S4, S3, I believe it's when your, um, your valves are closing uh, too soon. Uh, well, there's, uh, it, it signifies uh, early diastolic feeling uh, sound, all right? And of course your S4 uh, heart sounds it's a reflection of decreased ventricular compliance. So your ventricles are more stiff. So that's why you hear the S3, S4. Usually we wanna hear S1, S2, lubbed up, lubbed up, or, uh, well, that's normal. But when we hear uh, uh, lubbed up, uh, then these additional uh, heart sounds, then we're talking about a gallop. A gallop is fine in a very young child, but when you hear a gallop in an older adult, middle age and so forth, uh, there's a problem. There's a problem. Uh, let's see. So with this, uh, with the le left ventricular systolic failure, you have this low cardiac output. You have impaired tissue perfusion, and when you don't, when you have impaired tissue perfusion, you don't have that oxygen available to your tissues and organs, and so you go into anaerobic metabolism. Anaerobic meaning, ana meaning without oxygen. You have aerobic, anaerobic. Aerobic, there's oxygen available for metabolism. Anaerobic, you have no oxygen or very little available uh, for, your meta for the metabolic process. You also have fatigue, as I mentioned. Uh, let's see, we talked about uh, impaired perfusion and pulmonary congestion associated with left ventricular failure. Uh, please look at chart 35, and I have this written down uh, for you already. Uh, look at chart 35.1 uh, for left heart failure, uh, signs and symptoms. Um, so shortness of breath is very important, uh, is a very important signs and symptom uh, to evaluate in these patients with heart failure because the fluids are backing up into the pulmonary system. So it is an expected um, uh, sign. Uh, that you will see, a symptom that you will see. Um, you must also assess uh, the patient's activity level uh, tolerance. 
uh, the tolerance level by asking if they can perform uh, the normal ADLs, activities of daily living. Um, can they climb a flight of stairs without becoming fatigued or short, short of breath? And uh, many of these patients have this kind of heaviness, heaviness in their arms as well as their legs. Um, ask if they are able to perform simultaneous arm and leg work, uh, such as walking and carrying a bag of groceries. That's another indication that if they are not able to, that their activity level has uh, reduced. And so they're not getting that adequate cardiac output or perfusion. Uh, we want to ask about, uh, uh, ask, ask about uh, most strenuous activities in the past week. You don't want to go back over the last six months or the last year. You want to go back over the, uh, something more recent, the past week. Um, uh, because you're basically trying to see what their activity level has been like over the past week, see if it has diminished. Because sometimes patients, uh, they don't realize that, they've, uh, that their activity has decreased. And so asking what happened in the last week may reveal that, yeah, I used to be able to carry those groceries up three flights of stairs, and now I find myself uh, barely able to negotiate one flight of stairs. So the activity level has decreased, and this, these are things you want to know. Uh, these patients may have uh, chest discomfort. They may experience uh, palpitations, uh, skipping beats in the heart, um, or a fast heart rate. And again, this is due to poor perfusion uh, to the myocardium, to the heart muscle uh, from uh, left uh, heart failure. Um, now, as the ejection fraction, the percentage of blood that leaves the, the, the left ventricle uh, in particular, is compromised and reduced, um, then you have this kind of hydrostatic pressure uh, that builds up in the pulmonary vasculature. And of course, as I mentioned to you, this fills up the alveoli, alveoli uh, of the lungs and leads to pulmonary congestion. This is when you get the pulmonary symptoms. And this is why these patients cough. You have coughing with uh, left-sided heart failure as well because you have this fluid that is leaking into the uh, alveoli. Uh, patients with uh, early heart failure describe the coughing as irritating. Um, they also have, uh, and it's also nocturnal, meaning uh, it, it occurs at nighttime and it's usually non-productive. It's a non-productive cough. Uh, as the heart failure worsens, uh, these patients will begin to expectorate, and you better really remember this, frothy pink sputum. Um, and this is a life-threatening pulmonary edema, all right? Uh, there's also shortness of breath uh, due to increasing pulmonary venous pressure and pulmonary congestion. And so the patient may say they have uh, trouble catch, catching their breath. You may hear that as well. Is there a reason? You know, uh, honestly, I kind of do this sometimes to uh, to bring more attention to it because it's something that may, may be more prevalent in that condition. You may highlight certain things because it's good for you to to help you remember uh, things. I tend to be very colorful. I bold print things. I color things. I highlight things. Whatever you must do to help you to remember. Uh, all right, so these patients may also have an exertional uh, dyspnea, you know, when they, in other words, when they exert themselves, they become short of breath, and they cannot tolerate uh, certain levels of um, activity due to, or because of the shortness of breath. Um, these patients also develop uh, dyspnea at rest when they're in a recumbent position, in other words, when they're lying flat. Um, and this is also known as orthopnea. When your patients come into the ED, for example, or even if they're at home, how many pillows do you need in order to feel comfortable? So let's say if a patient requires three pillows, then we will, we will say three pillow orthopnea because they require three pillows in order to, you know, breathe more comfortable. 
two pillow all thought now, same thing. Same thing applies. So you want to ask them how many pillows they need when they sleep at nighttime, and you want to document that. Uh, some of these patients uh, may have to sleep in a recliner uh, or sleep upright in a bed, or they may have to sleep in a chair because they just have to be upright so their lungs expand uh, better. Uh, these patients may also describe what we call par paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, uh, which is uh, where patients describe su sudden awakening uh, with feelings of uh, breathlessness uh, about two to five hours after they fall asleep. They may experience this. Uh, so uh, when these patients uh, sit upright on the bed, uh, in the bed, or they dangle their feet while they're sitting in the bed, uh, or they walk, uh, this can actually relieve uh, that symptom, the breathlessness or the um, the paroxys paroxysmal uh, nocturnal dyspnea, shortness of breath at nighttime. All right. Now, when we're looking at left-sided heart failure, uh, we want to we want to think about the type of heart rhythms that you might see. Uh, and as uh, let's see, atrial fibrillation is the most common, but you also may see PACs, PVCs, and whatnot as well. You have these irregular heart rhythms. Because remember, in heart failure, the um, cardiac output is poor, so you're not even perfusing your coronary arteries. You know, you have, when, when, the, when uh, with the, the aorta, when blood is uh, pumped into the aorta, you have arteries that comes also back into the heart. And um, when you have a decreased cardiac output, then you don't have enough uh, blood to also supply your conduction system. Remember, we talked about the conduction system, um, SA node, AV node, you know, bond over his. So you don't get enough uh, uh, perfusion to those areas as well. You want to you want to observe for uh, you want to observe their respiratory rate, their rhythm, uh, the character of their uh, respiratory system, and also the SpO2 or the O2 saturation. Usually, their uh, respiratory rate might be greater than 20. Even, uh, even perhaps at rest, when it should usually be between uh, 12 and 20. You, you want to also uh, assess their orientation status. Remember, they're getting decreased perfusion to their brain. Older people are disoriented and confused because of the fact that they have uh, hypoxia to the brain. A chest X-ray may show an increased uh, size of the heart. Um, and also the apical pulse. You know, the apical pulse is normally in the the uh, the left. Let's see. It is the fifth intercostal space uh, and the left clavicular, a uh, mid clavicular line. So when you when you think about your clavicle. And then think about halfway, the halfway point in your clavicle, and you go down towards your heart, um, the, the, the fifth intercostal space, that's where you would normally find your apical pulse in your heart. But when the heart is enlarged, it will move from that spot. And so with, with your stethoscope, you may be listening in, uh, to the apical pulse in an entirely different area. And this is because that heart has enlarged and moved. And again, you'll learn about the apical pulse, how to check that. Um, and you can also check that when you, you can YouTube it and uh, check it out. Uh, well, yeah, just take a look at it. It'll uh, show you how to locate the apical pulse. Mid clavicular line, fifth in the costal space. That would be displaced. Uh, let's see, we talked about um, S3, S4 heart sounds. Uh, you want to also auscultate their breath sounds. Uh, you will hear crackles. Sometimes you hear wheezes, but crackles is more uh, prominent. Uh, and this is produced uh, by the intra, intra alveolar um, fluids uh, that fills the lungs. Um, and you'll first notice it in the basis of the lungs. And as the condition worsens, it begins to spread to the other portions or other lobes of the lungs as well. So listen for crackles. Wheezing is due to um, narrowing of the bronchial lumen. 
the bronchioles become narrow, all right? And so you hear wheezing because of these engorged pulmonary uh, vessels. And you also want to uh, document and what we call adventitious sounds uh, on inspiration and, and, and expiration. Adventitious sounds are any other breath sounds than normal. When we talk about normal breath sounds, we hear clear inspiration, expiration. But if you hear wheezing, crackles, ronchi, uh, strider, any of these uh, abnormal breath sounds, we refer to them as adventitious sounds, adventitious breath sounds. Y'all get that? Yes. yes. All right. Uh, so you all are already talking about how uh, somewhat difficult this is, a lot to remember and all. Imagine if I went through it really fast. I heard uh, somebody say that uh, when, when they were teaching how they just really talk really fast. But if I talk like that, you'll really be confused. So hopefully this will make it a little bit better, which is one of the reasons why I resort to voiceovers, because whatever I don't get to in class, you're able to still hear it. So all right, so um, look at uh, the right side of the heart. And look at the symptoms, at the clinical manifestations. Of JVD that we that I talked about, you have increased abdominal girth because that fluid is leaking into your abdominal uh, tissues and causing uh, ascites. Is what, well, well, actually, if you have ascites, you're going to have an increased abdominal girth. But anyway, so you have an in increased abdominal girth because all that fluid is backing up. You have the dependent edema that I talked about to your lower extremities. You have the enlarged uh, liver. Uh, you have a hepatojugular reflux, you know, that, that, that blood is just going back, that's, that, that the um, blood receives from the hepatic uh, circulation, ascites, and you have weight. Weight is the most reliable indicator of fluid gain or loss. Remember that. Do not forget that. If you're giving someone Lasix and you want to know if they're um, having good uh, outcomes uh, with that drug, <clears throat> you weigh them. When they came in, they were 220 pounds, volume overloaded. You've given a um, couple of days of Lasix, now they're down maybe five, seven pounds or whatnot. So that's a good indicator. Um, if a patient comes in, they say, hey, I'm normally 210, but now I'm 220. Uh, so they gained 10 pounds, no good. The heart cannot manage all that preload. All right, so uh, with the right side of the heart, we're talking about uh, systemic venous congestion um, occurring due to the right ventricle that is failing. So fluid is retained and of course pressure builds up into the venous uh, system. Um, and of course the venous, uh, uh, systemic uh, venous uh, congestion and peripheral edema uh, are associated with right ventricular failure. Uh, also take a look at uh, chart 35-2 uh, for right uh, heart failure, uh, signs and symptoms. You need to know the difference between the two. And as you can tell, one is more pulmonary, the other one is more, uh, um, comes from the peripheral uh, system, venous system. And so as we know, uh, when we have uh, decreased uh, blood flow to our organs, uh, they, it causes them to dysfunction. Uh, all right, so it talks about edema, uh, swelling. It, it uh, develops in the lower extremities and it does progress to the thighs and the abdomen, abdominal wall. Uh, these patients, their shoes might fit more tightly or shoes, shoes and socks may leave a kind of indentation uh, on swollen uh, feet. The fingers and uh, hands may also become swollen. And so uh, you may have to remove uh, rings, uh, their rings before you're not able to remove them. Uh, they can cut off circulation and cause gangrene. So you want to remove those 
teach that to your patients. When you feel yourself swelling, move, remove those. They probably shouldn't even wear rings, to be honest with you, especially depending on your condition. So weight gain uh, due to foot retention uh, can be as much as four to seven liters of fluid or 10 to 15 pounds uh, before uh, pitting edema will occur. Remember that pitting edema with that indentation? So you wanna make sure you weigh the patient every day, same clothing, same time, same scale. Uh, nausea vomiting develops due to liver engorgement or congestion from the fluid retention. This is a part of the GI system, of course. Uh, in advance, um, right-sided heart failure, when it's more severe, these patients develop ascites. And um, uh, this uh, increased abdominal girth from severe liver congestion. Remember, the liver is now congested. Um, when, when these patients are actually at rest, uh, they, um, they sometimes diurese. They sometimes develop, they start to uh, uh, have to urinate quite a bit. Um, and this is due to the fact that they have all this fluid retention, fluid retention on board. And so when they're lying down, typically what happens is the vasculature that leads to your, uh, your kidneys, they would begin to dilate. Uh, and of course, uh, you will begin to have to pee because you have this perfusion to your kidneys. And this can often uh, awaken these patients at night and they have to urinate uh, quite a bit. Uh, you also want to ask them about their nutritional history, uh, in particular uh, about their sodium intake. We're going to talk about the types of food uh, they're consuming, um, the, these bad foods, of course. Um, and so because these patients retain a loss of sodium, they have an increased uh, thirst, all right? Because more sodium on board, you get more thirsty. And so they tend to drink a lot of fluids. And when you drink a lot of fluids, you're increasing your, your preload, and it's a vicious cycle. So sometimes these patients might be placed on a fluid restriction, maybe 1,500, uh, uh, maybe 2,000 uh, um, liters of fluid restriction. All right. Uh, let's see, I think we talked about some. We talked about the JVD or jugular vein distension. Uh, we have to all, always measure the abdominal girth to see if it's growing, see if it's getting larger. And that's something that you want to document as well. You're assessing for jugular vein distension also. Um, we're checking also for hepatomegaly, uh, meaning enlarged uh, liver, uh, hepatojugular reflux and ascites, and also an increased liver, so uh, increased LFTs, uh, liver enzymes. So this way we know that the liver is uh, impacted. Um, abdominal fluid can reach as high as greater than 10 uh, liters. Um, and so all this volume in the GI system is actually placing a lot of pressure on the stomach as well as the intestines. And when the stomach and intestines has all that increased fluid, uh, these patients, it leads to early satiety. They become uh, full very, very easily. And of course, if you become uh, full too easy, you're not going to eat more. So you end up becoming malnourished because you, you, won't, you won't feel like eating. Uh, yeah, so you have early satiety. Uh, assess the patients uh, for dependent edema in the ankles and the legs, um, when they're, especially when they're ambulatory, when they're walking. But now, if that patient is, uh, is on strict bed rest or they can't get up and walk about, you, you probably won't see as much edema in the ankles and the legs, but you'll see it in the sacral area, the sacral edema, you know, because of the way they're lying in bed. So if they're amylating, swelling in the ankles and, and, um, and legs, if they're, on if they're restricted to the bed, you see the swelling in the sacral area instead. All right, and uh, these are just some of the, um, let's see, it's 150 now. So, uh, all right, so let's, all right. So these are the, um, the labs that you'll be looking at. 
Uh, you, you're looking at your electrolytes, your hemoglobin, hematocrit, uh, your BNP. Uh, there's a urinalysis that you're looking uh, at as well, your ABGs. Um, also imaging studies such as a chest X-ray, echocardiogram, and a pulmonary artery catheter, which you don't really need to know about. But when you get in uh, multi-systems, we'll kind of touch on it just a little so you'll seem intelligent when you uh, take multi-system. Uh, so electrolyte imbalance can occur from uh, complications of heart failure or can also occur due to side effects from drugs such as your diuretics. Uh, so remember to check your BMP uh, for your sodium levels, potassium, magnesium, calcium, as well as your chloride levels. So labs, labs, labs are very important. Uh, you want to also check your renal function because if the heart is not has failed as a pump, then you're not getting enough blood flow to your kidneys, and so your BUN and your creatinine will be elevated again, due to decreased perfusion to your kidneys. Your uh, hemoglobin, hematocrit, uh, they tend to be, you tend to be anemic. And this is because when, when you are holding on to a lot of volume, all right, because you can't, you're holding on to a lot of volume because you're not perfusing to your kidneys, so you're not urinating, so you're holding on to volume. You have more volume, and so your hemoglobin and hematocrit, uh, especially your hemoglobin, seems to be much lower because there's a hemodilution. You have more volume to elements, you have a dilutional effect. You can have the right amount of sodium, but if the volume increases in amount, it'll, it will uh, appear to be a dilutional effect. So it, it, you would appear to have a, a, hypo, uh, a hyponatremia because that volume. Uh, let's see, you talked about your BNP. It's used to diagnose uh, heart failure as well, especially diastolic heart failure. Uh, these uh, patients with acute uh, shortness of breath. Um, well, I won't read over that. Uh, basically, as I mentioned to you guys, uh, just because you have an, a high BNP, it doesn't mean you have heart failure. So just remember that. So you're looking at everything. All right. Because they could have a, uh, could have like some kind of primary lung dysfunction, like uh, pulmonary fibrosis. So it doesn't have to be the shortness of breath doesn't mean that you're always in heart failure. So just you know, keep that in mind. Um, patients with uh, renal disease can also have high uh, BNP levels. Um, as the heart failure therapy is optimized, in other words, uh, when um, you're treating uh, your heart failure patients and uh, you're optimizing their treatment, you should begin to see your BNP levels decrease. That's a good sign. A really elevated BNP, 1,000, 1,500. But now after you give the Lasix and you're treating them, the beta blockers, whatever it is they need, you see the BNP levels decreasing. And that's what you want to see. As far as urine, uh, urinalysis, uh, it, you, you want to look at the protein urea uh, and to see if they have a high specific gravity. If they're not perfusing their kidneys uh, very well, um, your kidneys uh, filtering systems can be destroyed and um, you might see a lot of uh, proteins in the urine. Protein shouldn't be in the urine. If there are proteins in the urine, it should be very little. Otherwise, there's uh, damage to, your, uh, to the membranes of the uh, kidneys. Uh, and because you're not urinating a whole lot, the urine-specific gravity will be elevated because you're not perfusing your kidneys. So uh, urinalysis is another test. These are just different tests that we can run on these patients to determine what's going on. We also have microalbuminuria. Uh, so you have uh, albumin in your urine. And uh, this is an early indicator of uh, decreased compliance of the heart. Uh, and it, it actually occurs before the BNP level rises. So your doctor may uh, get a uh, urinalysis to, uh, to see if the patient has albumin in the urine. Just an early indicator. You always want to focus on early indicators. Uh, you, don't, you don't ever want to be that type of clinician that wastes everything is in the late stage. Because then you may have dead patients. 
Um, so always think about early indicators, even with your NCLEX, your HESIs and whatnot, what is the early indicator? Sometimes they ask you what is the late sign, but I find it more helpful to know what are the early signs. Your ABGs can determine if there's hypoxemia, meaning the level of uh, oxygen in the blood. Hypoxia is uh, decreased oxygen in the tissues. Hypoxemia, that MIA, is blood. So decreased oxygen levels in the blood. So an ABG can reveal that as oxygen, uh, oxygen um, doesn't diffuse very easily, as I said, across the AC membrane it, when they become edematous. And therefore, when you do an ABG, it will show maybe an oxygen level of maybe 60%, which is pretty low. You should be between 80 and 100. So that particular um, lab will reveal that. Uh, let's see, we talked about the AC membrane. Um, also remember when someone hyperventilates, as may happen uh, in this condition, um, they, you'll find them in respiratory alkalosis because they're blowing off a lot of CO2. But when you retain CO2, these patients are in, which it means that they're breathing slowly. Now they're holding on to uh, CO2, they're in respiratory acidosis. This is important because your uh, your respiratory system does uh, change when you're talking about heart failure. So they may initially have a, a hyperventilation because they're trying to breathe, they may be anxious and so forth. So they will be, in, in, they'll have a, a high pH and a, and a low uh, PCO2. Uh, when they have uh, respiratory acidosis, they have a low pH, like less than 7.35, and a high CO2, high CO2, retaining CO2. And then when we're dealing with, the, with the, uh, the, the renals, we're talking about lactic acid accumulation, metabolic acidosis. With metabolic acidosis, the pH is low, lower than 7.35, and the bicarb is low, uh, lower than 24, I believe. The range can be between 22, 26, or uh, I wanna say 26 to 30. It kind of varies, it depends but it, it's low in both the uh, pH and the, and the, uh, the bicar. And of course, this is your, your, acidote, your uh, ABGs uh, in um, Adult Health One. So hopefully you remember that. Uh, check sex ray will show if, the, uh, that, uh, if there's left ventricular disease, it'll show if the heart is enlarged, which is called cardiomegaly. That megaly means enlarged. We remember hepatomegaly, enlarged liver, cardiomegaly, enlarged heart. Um, and again, so this uh, basically means uh, hypertrophy or dilation of the heart uh, chambers. An echocardiogram is another diagnostic tool uh, used for heart failure. It can, uh, it, it can look at the valves, valvular changes, uh, it can detect pericardial effusions. If the chambers are enlarged, this is an echocardiogram. It can also determine if there's ventricular hypertrophy, remember that uh, compensatory mechanism, so it can show if the myocardium is thickened. Uh, it can also check for the ejection fraction, the amount or the percentage of blood leaving the heart um, when the ventricles squeeze. So this can also tell us if a patient is in uh, um, heart failure. Remember if the uh, ejection fraction is less than 40, heart failure. The normal range of the heart of a heart is um, is 55 to 70. Uh, let's see. So the EKG, the EKG can actually show if a patient has ventricular hypertrophy. So EKG can determine that. It can also determine if we have a dysrhythmia, meaning like, let's say if this patient is in atrial fibrillation, it can determine that. You can also determine if a patient has myocardial ischemia because the, um, the ST wave, remember QRS, P, QRST wave. So if you look at the EKG, 
the um, the 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 ST will be depressed. See if I can. Uh, all right, so let me show you guys this while we add it, give you a visual. Um, so when we, when we want to know if a patient has uh, myocardial ischemia, this will show, all right, so this is the normal uh, ST uh, waveform or complex. This is the normal. But when it's depressed, it looks like this. See how depressed that is? That's ST depression. That means you're getting blood flow to the heart, but very low. And so your EKG will show this. Now, if you're not getting any blood flow, you have ST elevation. They look like tombstones. Uh, let me see if I can show you that as well. ST. That's the elevation in MI. Let's look at this one. All right, uh, let me know if you all if y'all can see this one. You see the ST elevation? All right, so on an EKG, um, if a patient is having an MI, this is what you'll see, this ST elevation. Looks almost like a tombstone. Some of them look like a tomb tombstone. These are not, not so much, but uh, let's see if I can find one. Maybe this one. You see that ST elevation? Now this is infarction or uh, ST elevation or an infarction. And the opposite when it's depressed would be more ischemia. All right. Um, let's see. So I just wanted to show you what uh, these different tools are able to do. These are tools that your advanced clinicians and also you as a non-advanced clinician that because you guys, are, you, 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 you're smart and you will be even smarter and so you'll be able to look at some of this information and know what's going on with your patients. You may think that this is too high. You say, well, oh, this is for the doctors to, to know, but you all would have to know this as well because you are the doctor's eyes and ears and you're calling them and you're reporting information. Uh, all right, so this is what we call a pulmonary catheter and it allows for assessment of cardiac function as well as fluid volume. So when we insert one of these catheters, we actually insert it on the right side of the heart. It goes through the inferior vena cava, maybe the superior vena cava or the subclavian vein. And then it goes into the, the threads into the right atrium, the right ventricle, through the, um, the pulmonary uh, artery uh, valve, and then it sets off into the pulmonary artery. When that, when that line, uh, that uh, this uh, this uh, catheter is placed into the pulmonary artery, it actually measures indirectly the volume on the left side of the heart. So if I want to if I want to know what a patient's preload is, it's not a direct measurement, but it it would give me a wedge pressure. We call it. P-A-W-P, -P. it's a wedge pressure. It tells us what's going on on the left side of the heart, but it's indirect. So let me show you guys a picture of what that looks like. It's a, it's a catheter, we don't use these a whole lot now in the ICU, but you still do see them. Uh, depending on what institution um, uh, you're in. Let me do this one. I like this one better. 
I think. Nope. Don't like that. All right. Uh, so this is a pulmonary artery, uh, a, a swan. We call it a swan gans catheter, and it tells us what that preload is. Also, um, uh, your afterload. It tells us so many different things, on a, a, particularly on the left side of the heart. So here's what I was showing you here. Uh, this catheter is inserted here. It goes into the left, the right atrium, the right ventricle into the pulmonary uh, valve and it sets off over here in the um, pulmonary uh, artery. I guess this is another one. Yeah, see how it goes, uh, the PA, it's a PA catheter and see how, how it travels and it sets right there, it remains there. And if we're looking at someone who has a wedge, uh, let's say the wedge may be between six and 10 the higher the wedge pressure, the more volume this patient has. So say if the wedge pressure, all right. So the wedge pressure is normally, I'm sorry, it's actually six to 10 right here. Can you all see six to 10 for the wedge pressure? Yeah, you, uh, what did you all say? I can, can you hear that? Yes. All right, so uh, if this wedge pressure is, let's say, 16, this means there is a lot of volume on board. This means the preload in this patient is very high, right? And so if the preload is very high, what kind of medication can we give this patient to reduce the preload? Diuretics. Exactly. So they give diuretics to decrease the preload. All right, now look look at this, the cardiac output. So remember I told you that the cardiac output in, the, in the, basically a normal adult is about five liters. So we have a range here, depending on the size of the patient too. It's between four and eight. So this, this, um, this, um, this PA catheter can let us know what the cardiac output is. And so if the cardiac output is, let's say, a 2.5, is that enough cardiac output to supply the systemic, our, our tissues and organs? No. No, it isn't. You need at least between four and eight. And so if you don't have enough cardiac output, this is what the PA catheter will show us. And, and so if it's, if it's too low, then you're not perfusing your organs very well. So it may be because the myocardium is weak and we may have to place these patients on uh, digoxin to give uh, more strength. It could also be because the, the, uh, the afterload is very high. And so we wanna reduce the afterload by giving uh, these drugs that dilates the blood vessels and then your cardiac output would be better. So depending on what the problem is. All right, but it's measuring indirectly what's happening on the left side. Inserted on the right, reading on the left. That makes sense. Um, all right, so I just wanted to show you that. So when you guys get, in, get into multi-systems, uh, you'll see this again in more detail. But at least you've been exposed to it. All right, so uh, as far as planning and implementing, uh, responding, uh, here's what we want. We want increasing gas exchange. We want to improve our cardiac uh, output. We want to decrease fatigue. These are goals. And we want to prevent pulmonary edema. How do we prevent uh, pulmonary edema in a patient who has a high afterload because of hypertension? Anyone?
patient has worse, worsening pulmonary edema, they have a high afterload, how do we, re how, how do we reduce it? Depending on the reason for the high afterload, right? Because it could be hypertension, it could be a bowel problem. Well, let's say if it's hypertension, what do we do to decrease the afterload? The ACE inhibitors or ARVs. Yeah, we can. That'll decrease our afterload. Now, also keep in mind as far as, uh, well, I talked about that already. As far as a preload reducer, your diuretics are preload reducers. So we talked about that. That can also help with uh, as far as increasing gas exchange um, and also cardiac output. If we decrease that volume overload, then the heart, uh, the cardiac output can be, can, can improve and that can be better gas exchange because all that volume is not backing up. So just think about all these things. Look at, when you look at this particular slide, it says a whole lot in terms of what things can I think of? What scenarios can I think of if there's a high afterload, if there's an increased preload? What kind of drugs can I give uh, to, to decrease the preload, to decrease the afterload? What can I do to strengthen uh, that heart muscle and whatnot? Now, here's one thing I want you guys to see. I, I think you can see me. When someone, uh, when, someone when, when their heart is beating really fast, and, uh, be, and, and, um, and the muscle is very uh, weak. Uh, when you give them digoxin, digoxin can slow down that, that rate uh, of, the, of that heart uh, beating like that because you go from this to squeeze, 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 squeeze. So it slows down, it slows down that heart rate because it takes time for your heart to squeeze in a kind of a powerful, strong way, all right? So digoxin has, can have that effect, not only on the conduction system, but also uh, on the, um, uh, it can affect the heart rate as well. And, and, and it can, uh, gives us a good cardiac output because now, now that muscle is squeezing with much more power, much more strength. Now, these are the problems that we don't want to see. This is what we want to improve. We, uh, when you see these problems, there's decreased gas exchange, uh, potential for decreased perfusion because of the low cardiac output. When there's weakness and fatigue due to low cardiac output, you're not perfusing uh, your body, and potential for pulmonary edema. This is what we don't want. We want to reverse this. We want, uh-oh, we want this, not this. Uh-oh, wait a minute. We want this, right? The improving. We don't want this. So these are our prior priority collaborative uh, uh, issues. Uh, let's see. All right, so um, I'm going to get you all to read the rest of this information in this slide, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, for example, uh, as far as decreased uh, ex uh, gas exchange, uh, the expected out outcome uh, is that the patient would have optimal spontaneous uh, breathing pattern uh, that increases uh, gas exchange and maintains a serum CO2 level with the normal limits. So what is the normal CO2 level between 35 and 45? Uh, as far as an intervention is concerned, we're monitoring the respiratory rate, the rhythm, uh, the quality at least every one to four hours, uh, with auscultating breath sounds every four to eight hours, and all this depends on what unit the patient is in. Uh, as far as potential for decreased perfusion, uh, expected outcome is patient will have increased perfusion with adequate cardiac output. The intervention, uh, a variety of drugs that are used to uh, enhance uh, perfusion. So you will be looking at table 35-3 uh, 
Um, and these are drugs that can uh, enhance perfusion. And surgery may also be required depending on uh, what the problem is if the non-surgical uh, management fails. And so we have these drugs that improve uh, our stroke volume and those include uh, those that reduce the afterload, those that reduce our preload, and those that improve our cardiac muscle contractility. Uh, the latter, again, uh, having to do with uh, digoxin. And so the main role of a nurse is to give the medications as prescribed, uh, monitor their uh, therapeutic effects, also their adverse effects, and teach the family and the patient about uh, drug therapy. Now, um, let's see, so, um, all right, so here, uh, so we talk about ventilation assistance as, as far as increasing gas exchange, uh, monitoring respirations, auscultating breath sounds. We wanna place these patients in high fowler's position. It makes it easier for them to breathe, especially when they're short of breath. And we want to maintain an oxygen saturation of greater than 90% uh, in these patients. Um, now, we already went over this one. This is the one I moved to the to the front, so we don't have to go over that one again. But you know, read it again just to make sure you understand it better. All right, so. Uh, probably won't be able to get through all these medications because around slide 25 is when the voiceover kicks in. But even if we don't uh, get to uh, up to that point, I do have uh, the information written here, but let me try to get through this as much as I can. Uh, as far as ACE inhibitors, we're talking about enalapril. Basal Tech doesn't have a pril, but it is, um, uh, it is uh, an ACE inhibitor. And also monopril is also another one. Uh, the doctor may or clinician may prescribe these drugs for patients with mild um, heart failure uh, from uh, left ventricular dysfunction. Um, and so uh, these drugs become your first line uh, drug of choice. Now, some, some of these doctors uh, may have, to, or these clinicians may have to start these patients on uh, the ARBs, uh, ARB which we'll discuss uh, next. Uh, but they may have to prescribe that one because these patients who take the ACE inhibitors, uh, it can cause a nagging uh, dry cough, especially in African-Americans. So keep that in, in mind. Um, so your ACE inhibitors would be your first line of drug choice, nalopril, basotech, monopril. Uh, if a patient is in acute heart failure, showing acute heart failure symptoms, um, then uh, IV Basotech, which works faster because it is IV, uh, will be prescribed, all right? Potassium, uh, of, of patients on ACE inhibitors, they, they excrete sodium and water, but they retain potassium. And so because of that, uh, you should avoid foods that are high in potassium. So check this out. So. You give a patient spirolactone and you give them an ACE inhibitor and you give them a diet uh, that contains potassium. Tell me what will happen to the potassium level. Would it be increased or decreased? Increased. Right. So, do you want to avoid diet, a diet high in uh, that will, you know, like these salt substitutes that are used, they contain a lot of potassium. So these patients shouldn't be on uh, these potassium, uh, these salt substitutes because of the potassium, because it has a way of increasing their potassium levels. The spirolactone, potassium sparing, will increase their potassium level. And this medication, the ACE inhibitor, will also cause an increase in their potassium level. So you're looking at all three of those. So be careful. So your salt substitutes are not a healthful, healthful option uh, for everyone. Uh, many of them contain potassium chloride uh, in place of sodium, in place of sodium chloride. 
So potassium uh, consumed in access uh, can be harmful to your patients. So ideally you want your patients to be completely salt free. It can, it can, uh, uh, it can be done. They just have to get acclimated to the taste. One side effect of your ACE inhibitor uh, is that first dose, it's called first dose hypotension. So if these patients are in a, in a doctor's office preferably, um, or the home care nurse is at the patient's home or, in the, or the patient is in the hospital, uh, the patient should dangle on the side of the bed uh, before getting up because that first dose can uh, result in hypotension. Uh, so this patient is getting ready to be discharged from the hospital and they're getting uh, an ACE inhibitor before they are discharged. Make sure you give it to them early enough. I mean, you don't wanna give it to them, you know, like right now, and then you tell them they, they need to leave within the next five or 10, uh, 20 minutes. Um, you, you know, because PO medications uh, by mouth uh, takes about up to maybe 45 minutes to an hour to absorb. So you wanna give, you wanna make sure you give it to them early enough that maybe an, an hour or two will um, will expire, and then that way uh, you can check their their, uh, their vital signs and determine if they are uh, in um, if their blood pressure has been affected, because this can lead to dizziness and the patient can injure uh, themselves. So safety is very important here. Um, now, ARBs is the next one. ARBs is uh, essentially a combination of uh, uh, ACE inhibitors. Uh, is that the one? Wait a minute. Yeah, your arms is basically a combination. And see, when we think about the um, the ROS system, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, these drugs uh, impede those steps. At some step in the process of the the arms impedes the aldoster uh, the angiotensin. Uh, I'm sorry, the aldosterone system. Um, when the aldosterone system uh, kicks in, this is when patients retain uh, sodium and water. And so ARBs will prevent that particular step in the process. And then your ACE inhibitors can prevent your uh, renin from changing into angiotensin, which uh, that can also uh, prevent this, um, this process from happening where you have the vasoconstriction as well as this volume overload uh, because this is what happens when the RAS system kicks in. So this is why you give these drugs in combination. Uh, with your ARBs, you have Valsartan, your Herbisartan, and your Losartan. Um, and these are some of the medications, well, these are the medications you're going to have to look up as well for your next test. Um, hopefully you saw my, uh, my announcement where I talked about you can uh, create a grid, you can create a PowerPoint for yourselves. Uh, you, uh, hey, you can even work on it as a, as a group. Let's say you take the different classifications of these drugs, and uh, one person uh, one person does I don't know ACE inhibitors. The other person does ARBs. The other one does uh, the this one Arnie. And uh, you create the PowerPoints. You put it together and you exchange it with one another. I have a way you want to do it. Um, and we can touch on that a bit too, because it's almost time to let you go. Um, all right, so these are your ARBs. ACE inhibitors in your ARBs is a combination. It suppresses the, excuse me, the ROS system, uh, which is activated in response to uh, decreased uh, renal blood flow. This is why the ROS system kicks in. We talked about that. The ACE inhibitor, so this is what it does. The uh, ACE inhibitors prevent conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Uh, this, and and this, results, uh, this results in arterial dilation. And when the, when, the arteri when the arteries dilate, then your stroke volume increases because it's not going against all that pressure. That's your ACE inhibitor. That's what it does. This is, a, I'm, I'm talking about that ROS uh, uh, compensatory mechanism, all right? So the ACE inhibitor will prevent 
angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And so you get less basal constriction, more vasodilation. All right. And so as far as ARBs are concerned, it blocks the effect of the angiotensin 2 receptors. So you have a decreased arterial uh, resistance, and this causes also um, um, arterial dilation. Uh, when the Ross system kicks in, it actually causes vasoconstriction. So keep that in mind as well. So you're trying to prevent that. Uh, these drugs also, they block aldosterone. And when aldosterone is blocked, it prevents sodium oil and water retention. And so you're actually excreting, uh, you're actually urinating the sodium and water if the tubules, the kidneys are, are functioning well. And so when sodium and wa water are excreted, you have less uh, fluid uh, volume overload. Remember, wherever sodium goes, water goes. And so uh, uh, if, if you don't give this particular medication, you're going to have increased volume in effect. So that's why it's so important. Uh, these two drugs, they work better in uh, Euro-Americans, uh, more so than African-Americans. Uh, these patients should be well hydrated before starting these drugs. If they're not hydrated, you want to start these drugs at a very low dose. Um, all right, so remember with your ARBs, one of the adverse effects of taking this drug for patients with renal dysfunction is increased hyperkalemia or hyperkalemia increased potassium. Um, all right, so three minutes before 2.30, if anyone wants to get off about that time, you can. Um, I will continue for about another 15 minutes until I get to the uh, voiceover, which that'll take over from there. Um, and if you have any questions, just go ahead and shoot me an email. Um, so let me go ahead and get through the rest of this. Uh, this next uh, classification is RNA or this sub, uh, sub Q, uh, uh, vitriol, and valsartan. Uh, you probably heard the commercials on TV uh, on uh, Tresto or Entresto. Um, and so this is an angiotensin receptor um, uh, nephrolysin inhibitor. So it's, it's an inhibitor just like the ACE inhibitor. And so these drugs have both ARBs and ACE inhibitor properties. So they're doing, they have a little of both. Uh, this medication uh, has shown uh, to reduce uh, death and hospitalization uh, with patients who have class two through four heart failure uh, with a decreased ejection fraction. If you look, um, I think I provided a uh, provided some information in here for you, but look at look at the different classifications of heart failure. They go from or, or stages stages one through four. Um, the higher the stage, the more severe your CHF uh, CHF symptoms are. Um, so your uh, Entresto is your first line uh, drug in this particular class. Uh, you want to avoid uh, giving this medications uh, in patients who have a history of angio, angio edema. Um, uh, there are other side effects uh, from this medication, uh, hypotension, hyperkalemia, uh, cough, because remember ACE inhibitors causes coughing as well, uh, dizziness, uh, and renal uh, failure. Um, so remember, uh, these drugs are combined. So what you see in ACE inhibitors, what you see in ARBs, you'll see in Entresto because it has both properties. Um, uh, listen, let's see. So it's 2.30. Before you all get off real quickly, let me, let me do something um, just to make sure you guys understand this. Uh, let's see. Here. All right, so the cardiac drugs I added, just in case you don't know, this is under module one. Under module one. You scroll down, you have the cardiac drugs here. You click on it. 
when you click on this link here, it'll download over uh, down here to the bottom left hand corner in a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Don't know if you'll be able to see this, so I'm going to have to reshare again. But yeah, you won't be able to see this. Uh, all right. So I'm going to share this again so you can see the PowerPoint presentation. All right, so these are the cardiac drugs. What I want you to do is to classify classify these drugs. The only ones that really you're going to find that needs to be classified in one category is your, um, your ACE inhibitors. The rest of them will have their separate uh, classifications. Not looking for a whole lot, but just make sure you know the classification, you know what is, why it's given, why, yeah, why is it given, the indications, in other words, uh, beta blocker for maybe um, uh, high blood pressure or something like that. The mechanism of action, how does it work? This, this doesn't have to be long and drawn out, just put it in your own words. Um, is there any contraindications? Are there side effects? Um, and what is the nursing uh, special responsibilities or considerations? And so these are the drugs here. All right, these are all your cardiac drugs here. Morphine is not necessarily, not necessarily a cardiac drug, but if a patient is really anxious, um, then this, this drug can be given and it can um, lower their anxiety levels. You can also dilate your uh, blood vessels uh, so it can, be, it can be an after low reducer as well as a pre low reducer uh, because it's dilating those blood vessels. And of course, potassium is not a cardiac drug, but we do use it for this for these purposes. Uh, you got your heparin, your propanolol, uh, antiplase, which is a clot clot busting uh, drug. Um, and of course, these are some of the other ones. Remember, this is an uh, this is an ARB. This is a um, ACE inhibitor. Um, and then uh, here, uh, fluoresceamide, lisinopril, nitroglycerin, hydrolyzine. So all of these drugs, you're going to make sure you, you, you classify them first. That'll take away five of them by itself. And then you want all this information here on these drugs for your next, um, for your first exam. If you know these, you should be fine. Anyone have any questions about these? About, you'll probably construct the PowerPoint. You may do cards. You may do, uh, well, index cards or you may do a grid, it's up to you. This is not something you have to turn in, but for your own learning. And again, I will be sending out a focus sheet uh, within the next few days or so, but don't expect it before the weekend. I need to make sure you are reading. All right, and so if anybody needs to uh, drop off, you can. My apologies for keeping you four minutes. And so, and for the rest of you, if you have any questions, just go ahead and shoot me an email. I just wanna make sure I get through the rest of this. All right, uh, so, um, with the, uh, the ARNI or the Entresto, we're monitoring the potassium levels, remember, because with the ACE inhibitor, uh, you, you excrete sodium and water, but you hold on to potassium. So you are going to monitor the potassium level. You want to also observe the creatinine levels as well. Uh, you want to assess for orthostatic hypotension when they go from a lying sitting to standing position. Uh, they may drop like 20 uh, milli, milli, uh, milliliters, I think it's milligrams, uh, millimeters of mercury, sorry. sorry. Uh, so you're checking for orthostatic hypertension, acute uh, confusion. Uh, again, you can drop the pressure so low that you're not getting um, perfusion to your brain. Um, you're looking for poor peripheral perfusion. Uh, you're also looking for reduced urine output in uh, patients with a low systolic uh, blood pressure which these medications can uh, cause. Uh, let's see, I'll let you guys read about human BNP, uh, not something that I'm necessarily uh, testing on, but I would like for you to read it anyway. Uh, 
Um, all right, so we're talking here about interventions that reduce the preload. There's nutritional therapy. There's also drug therapy, such as your diuretics and your venous uh, vasodilators. When there is increased fluid in the ventricles, the cardiac muscles are overstretched and the ventricles will contract less forcibly, such that occurs in uh, heart failure. Now, interventions are needed to reduce the preload uh, uh, by decreasing the volume uh, and the pressure that is in the left ventricle. Uh, again, uh, this, uh, this will lead to uh, decreasing ventricular muscle, muscle stretch and contraction. So you want to make sure you do something, uh, interventions to decrease the uh, preload. Uh, these interventions uh, are needed in patients with uh, heart failure uh, who have total body uh, sodium and, uh, and fluid overload. They have too much. So as far as uh, nutritional therapy, uh, the goal of therapy is to reduce the sodium and, and water retention. In turn, this reduces the workload of the heart. Uh, the physician or the clinician may order a low sodium diet. This is when we're talking about nutrition. And this can decrease fluid retention, decrease uh, sodium, decrease fluids. Uh, so they may be placed on a low sodium, uh, reduced the sodium uh, intake of like maybe three grams. It may, be, ha may have to be reduced even less than that. Uh, and so for further reduction in sodium intake, you want to avoid uh, high sodium foods such as ham, bacon, pickles, uh, and all salt, 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 salt uh, in cooking. Um, so uh, the patients may also have to be placed on a, on a, um, a, two, a two gram sodium diet. Uh, so you have to re be really careful uh, with even a two gram sodium diet. Uh, because it can even be harmful. So you may have to, as I say, these patients really need to get used to not having, using alternate uh, seasonings, if you will, instead of all that salt. So as far as fluid restriction, uh, patients with excessive aldosterone secretion, remember that ROS system? When that aldosterone is increased, uh, sodium in water is going to be increased also. It also and when sodium is, is increased, these patients become very thirsty. Yeah, they become very thirsty. So then you begin to drink more water and now you get more fluid on, on board. And so it just leads to worsening, worsening condition. So in this case, um, the, the clinician may limit the intake of uh, fluid to two liters uh, per day, giving most of those fluids during the daytime and less towards the night. Um, so you want to ensure that you're monitoring the intake and output very carefully. Um, so again, remember you're with aldosterone, sodium and water is being retained. And this is why you give these, uh, these ARBs because the, the ARBs, it uh, prevents that conversion from angiotensin II to uh, aldosterone, aldosterone. If you can prevent that, then you excrete sodium and water instead of retaining sodium and water. So as far as weight, uh, weighing patients daily, um, one kilogram of weight gain or loss equals to one liter retained or loss respectively. So if you gain a uh, one kilogram, it means you're retaining uh, one liter of fluids, you're retaining it. If you lose one, one uh, kilogram, um, a fluid, it means you're losing uh, one liter of fluid. Uh, again, uh, use the same scale every morning before breakfast for a more accurate measurement of a weight. And keep in mind, uh, there should be an expected uh, decrease in the weight due to excessive uh, weight loss uh, from the body. Excuse me. All right, so um, the next one uh, we uh, discuss here is, um, we're still talking about, uh, well, now we're talking about drugs to reduce the preload. Um, so morphine, I told you with morphine, uh, it does decrease anxiety uh, in these patients with acute heart failure. 
but it also decreases the uh, preload because it's dilating. It has an effect on the smooth muscle portion of the uh, arterial system. So uh, when we when you dilate the arterial system, you, you, when you dilate the arterial system, not only are you causing the blood vessel to dilate, meaning it, it takes more time to fill that space and that blood to return to the right side of the heart as preload, but it also dilates those vessels, meaning your afterload is decreased as well. Uh, morphine can also slow respirations, and it can also reduce pain associated with an acute myocardial infarction. If fluid restrictions and diet are not effective, uh, diuretics would be your first line uh, drug of choice in older patients uh, with heart failure uh, who also have fluid uh, overload. And uh, this drug enhances uh, renal excretion of sodium and water by reducing um, the circulating blood volume. So it helps you to excrete uh, that volume. When you decrease blood volume, you decrease your preload. Uh, when you decrease your preload, you're, you're reducing your systemic and pulmonary congestion. Uh, the type of diuretic depends on the severity of the heart failure and renal function. And what I mean by that is when you talk about your loop diuretics, they have the most powerful diuretics. Some of your loop diuretics are your uh, Lasix, Demodex, and Bumex. Uh, and this is the, these are the most effective for treatment of severe fluid, severe fluid uh, volume overload, most powerful. Then you have your thiazide diuretics, which is another form of diuretic, different classification, but a subcategory. Uh, uh, it's not a loop diuretic, it's a thiazide type of diuretic. Examples, hydrochlorothiazide and also xeroxidilin. Uh, and this is for patients with mild volume overload. Uh, and it, it is uh, referred to as self-limiting uh, due to the fact that once the edema or the fluid loss occurs, the diuresis is going to stop. So there's less chances of these patients taking the thiazide diuretic uh, becoming um, less dehydrated. Now with Lasix, you can become dehydrated. You're spilling over a lot of volume, you're wasting potassium, but with your thiazide diuretic, um, you're not losing as much volume. Some patients develop uh, uh, diuretic uh, uh, resistance, um, and so they're not peeing as much, and so they retain that edema. And so the doctor may uh, prescribe a loop diuretic in combination with a thiazide diuretic as a combination therapy, uh, hoping to work on different parts of the, uh, the loops located in your uh, kidneys. And this can sometimes help to uh, diuresis uh, these patients. Uh, other methods, uh, there may be a continuous infusion of IV Lasix or may rotate uh, two different types of loop diuretics. So you may get uh, Lasix and then the Demodex or Lasix or Bumex or Demodex or Bumex. So they'll just kind of keep, uh, you're trying to just work on those different receptors uh, located uh, in the, um, the renal uh, loop system, a tub a tubules those loops, you know. Uh, so we wanna watch and monitor uh, for low potassium, uh, watch for uh, deficiencies uh, such as these neurological uh, muscular signs and symptoms such as generalized weakness, uh, depressed reflexes, irregular heart rate as well. Uh, the physician may prescribe potassium supplements uh, or order potassium sparing diuretic instead, such as spirolactone. Um, because these patients are more, but, but patients who take spirolactone, they are at risk for a high risk for dysrhythmias because the potassium level, uh, increases. So you certainly want to place these patients on a monitor. These people will be, uh, anyway. Um, all right. So that is that one. Let me see where we are now. So it's 2.45 now. And um, I have time. Let's see, let me see who's on first because I may be talking to myself. All right, so there's still quite a few people on. All right, so let me keep on going. 
I don't have a doctor's appointment until 445, uh, 430 rather, but I don't have to leave uh, anytime soon. So I told you all there's a lot of information here. Um, all right, so we talked about the preload. So let's talk about uh, the, well, let me do it this way. So, um, uh, because a lot of this you guys are going to be looking up anyway, so I don't have to really spend a whole lot of time on it. When we talk about uh, drugs that enhance contractility, this is inotropic. Inotropic means uh, the contractile force of the muscles of the heart. Inotropic, the contractile muscles of the heart. When we talk about coronotropic, we're talking about the, uh, as far as it, it, um, it affects the rate, corono rate. Uh, inotropic, the muscular, muscular uh, functions of the heart. So uh, we tend to give these patients the joxin um, uh, to help strengthen their heart muscle. So inotropic drugs enhances contract, uh, contractilities, uh, again, such as your digoxin. This is also called a cardiac glycoside. Uh, and it's used to treat uh, heart failure with uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, sometimes uh, your clinicians may prescribe a vasodilator and a beta blocker as well with this drug. Uh, and it really helps these patients uh, that much more because you're decreasing the heart rate and you're uh, dilating those uh, blood vessels and the heart has to work. It works less, um, it is less overwork uh, for your heart. So you, you have that, that great contractile force from digoxin you're, you're dilating those blood vessels, that, that, that arterial system, and the heart has to pump against less pressure. It's a win-win. So other inotropic drugs are dobutamine, uh, milrenone, and also Semdax. Uh, so digoxin does help to decrease signs and symptoms such as uh, dyspnea or shortness of breath. And it also improves functional activity because if the heart is pumping well enough, along with the combination of the beta blocker and the vasodilators, well, you're getting better perfusion. So your activity level increases. You don't have all that blood backing up into the pulmonary system. Um, so digoxin, uh, when given with uh, ARBs, uh, beta blockers, and diuretics, it reduces hospitalizations. But because uh, they're taking digoxin, um, uh, they, they, as there's a chance they may have digoxin toxicity. This is one of the reasons why uh, they really don't give a lot of digoxin uh, too much because it can lead to dish toxicity, which you will have to know the, as far as when you create your drug cards, make sure you include the signs and symptoms of dish toxicity. Uh, the mechanism of action for, um, see, this is something you all are going to look at. So I'll let you look at that. Before you give digoxin, remember as far as your nursing responsibilities, you take that apical pulse for one full minute. You don't check your, your, your radio pulse for a full minute. You check your apical pulse for a full minute. Um, drugs, uh, a drug interacts, um, uh, this drug interacts with many of the, uh, um, or should I say drugs, they, they, they do interact with mass such as antacids. And so as far as the absorption of the drug is pretty erratic is it's uh, the, the absorption of the drug is it's, uh, it, it, it's not absorbed very well. So um, when you take an, an, an antacid, you know, like MOM or something like that, when you take an antacid um, with acetic drugs, acetic drugs such as like your digoxin, your uh, dilantin, your thorazine, uh, your iso, uh, niazid, those are uh, acetic drugs. And when you give those in combination with your antacids, um, they cause absorption to be decreased. And so antacids and acetic drugs given together causes decreased absorption. If you have decreased absorption of these drugs, then your therapeutic levels would be subtherapeutic. All right? They'll be subtherapeutic. They won't be, you won't have the normal. See, in order for the drug to actually work, for example, uh, your dilantin. If you don't want seizures, then you want a therapeutic level. But if you give this 
dilantin with an antacid is going to affect the absorption and therefore uh, you'll have low levels of concentrations of that drug. And this will uh, lead to subtherapeutic uh, or reduced therapeutic effects. So be careful about the combination of those drugs and also patient teaching. Remember I told you that. Uh, so your beta blockers, uh, AKA or beta adrenergic blockers or AKA beta blockers, uh, some patients, they have this circulating catecholamines that we talked about uh, and the sympathetic stimulation. Uh, this can actually worsen uh, your cardiac conditions uh, because everything is hyper-hyper. Uh, constriction of your, um, your arterial system, uh, increased heart rate, heart has to work too hard. And so this is because of the circulating uh, catecholamines, the sympathetic stimulation. So the beta blockers, they reverse uh, these effects. This drug must be started very slowly. Uh, you must observe the patient for a low uh, blood pressure. You must observe them for bradycardia or a low heart rate and also dizziness. Uh, beta blockers such as Coreg, Toprol, uh, bis Bisoprolol, um, and also uh, metoprolol, uh, tartrate. Now you're gonna, you'll see uh, uh, metoprolol, tartrate, or metoprolol uh, succinate, they're not the same. So um, I think that we'll be looking up low pressure. Um, I think that's your, uh, the metoprolol. So you, once you look that up, um, you should, it should be listed as a beta blocker. Um, you want to observe for observe the blood pressure, their pulse. Uh, also observe the activity intolerance and orthopnea. They may become short, short of breath. Um, you give this medication and it works too well, it can uh, lead to worsening of your heart failure. So you have to observe for that. Uh, beta blocker can actually lead to improved activity, uh, less ho hospitalizations, and it can also improve the ejection fraction. Um, a resting heart rate should be between 55 and 60. So it slightly increase if a patient is exercising. Uh, so you'll see a lot of patients who, uh, who are discharged when they have a certain, uh, there's certain, um, when a patient, uh, uh, how can I say this? Uh, when they're given a beta blocker, um, and because they have maybe an MI or a heart failure, it can reduce those hospitalizations. It can lead to um, a better management in the community as opposed to uh, having to go to the hospital all the time because you're decompensating. All right, uh, the next one here is your, your aldosterone antagonist. Think about what that means. Remember, aldosterone is that uh, hormone that causes us to hold on to sodium in water. We're talking about the Ross system. And so this antagonist causes uh, us to, uh, or causes that process uh, to be more reversed. So you, in other words, you excrete sodium in water, but you will uh, retain uh, so, uh, a pot a potassium. Um, and so this drug is indicated for stage two through four heart failure. Remember I told you with stage one through four, four being the worst, uh, one being the least. Um, and also it's given, for, given to a patient who has an ejection fraction of 35% or who has a history of diabetes. Uh, some of the drugs are spirolactone and eplerenone is another one. Uh, uh, this drug decreases uh, risk of dysryth dysrhythmias from uh, low potassium because remember if you give Lasix, you, it's a potassium uh, wasting uh, drug. But if you give, uh, so with the, with the aldosterone, uh, you have less waste of potassium, and so it preserves the potassium. And so there's less chances of a dysrhythmia, but you still wanna place them on a monitor because it can also have a, a hyperkalemia. So this aldosterone antagonist, it blocks the effect of aldosterone, which decreases uh, the amount of sodium in water retained. So when you give aldosterone, this aldosterone antagonist, which is um, talking about spirolactone, uh, sodium and water will be uh, excreted. Um, sometimes uh, this medication might be prescribed every other day 
uh, for patients who are high risk of developing hyperkalemia. It also provided uh, a link here so that you can look at the different stages. So take a look at that. And uh, let's see, so the last one is the, uh, the, uh, the calcium channel blockers. Uh, Iva uh, Braden is one of the other ones. Uh, and it is indicated if you give this drug, you have to give it to uh, heart failure patients who are stable. These patients have to be stable. And it is considered a first line drug in this particular class. Uh, it's used in patients uh, with a heart failure or indicated in patients with a heart uh, with an ejection fraction of less than 35%. Um, also is used in uh, patients with uh, sinus rhythm with a resting heart rate of greater than 70. So in other words, if the patient's ejection fraction is less than 35 and they have a resting heart rate of uh, greater than 70, you can give this medication. Um, uh, it is also given to patients who can, um, who can tolerate uh, beta blockers uh, or who have, uh, who have a, a contraindication to a beta blocker. So you can give it to those patients as well. You cannot give this medication to patients who have a hypotension because it would cause more hypotension. Patients who have a six sinus syndrome or SSS, if they have third degree AV block, which means the atria and the ventricles are not communicating. Um, if they have a pacemaker, and also if they have severe hepatic impairment, if their liver is impaired, you cannot give this drug. Uh, side effects, uh, it can cause bradycardia, uh, hypertension, uh, hypertension, uh, AFib. Uh, it can also call a it can be it can cause a condition called a luminous uh, phenomena, and what this is is a visual brightness. This is some visual brightness that you that the patients will see, uh, but this should disappear over time as far as this visual brightness, and that's the, one of the only uh, side effects the patient has. Uh, also, you want to teach these patients. This is very important when you're talking about your drugs how to take these medications. Do you take it before a meal? Do you take it with meal? Do you take it after meal? So uh, teach patients to take uh, this medication with meals and uh, you want to avoid taking this medication with grapefruit, grapefruit juice and also St. John's wort. That's a kind of a herbal um, uh, thing. Um, so these are things that you want to make sure you note when you when you're making up these index cards, uh, because these medications can affect the absorption rate uh, of these drugs. So you want to be really careful. Um, you must teach these patients how to uh, check their radio pulse when taking this particular this particular medication, and they should report any irregularity or low heart rate to their physician. So here we go again. We're talking about patient teaching. I'm going to highlight that in red. All right. Uh, let's see, not much here. Uh, the, the, these patients may require a CPAP. Uh, they may also require, because CPAP can also lead to heart failure as well. You know, all kinds of problems, hypertension and so forth. Um, and also, it talks about a CRT. Uh, this is what they call, uh, it's a biventricular pacing. So you're, you're pacing both ventricles, bi meaning both, bilateral. So uh, this particular device uh, will stimulate your ventricles to squeeze. So with the squeezing uh, comes an increased ejection fraction, an increased cardiac output, and an increased MAP. MAP is a mean arterial pressure. We want, with a mean arterial pressure, you want that number to look like 65 or greater. What mean arterial pressure means is, uh, it means that a patient is getting or not getting um, adequate perfusion to their vital organs. The lower that number, the less you're getting perfused to your vital organs. 
that the number is around 65 or maybe 65, 70 or whatnot, you're getting better perfusion to your organs. If you're at a 45 uh, mean arterial pressure, it means your blood pressure is probably pretty low. So you're not getting very good perfusion. Not getting very good perfusion to, uh, for example, your kidneys, um, you're not producing any urine. So when you look at that Foley bag on the side of that bed, and you see that this patient's uh, urine output is now 20 cc's for the last hour, because you should have at least 30 cc's per hour. And if you have, let's say 25 cc's for the next two hours, and you look up there on that monitor, you see the blood pressure, 130 over 70, and you're looking at the parenthesis next to it, you see, let's say a 45, but you know why this patient is not perfusing. Well, I won't say 135 over 70, probably say like uh, 90 over 40. So you know that not only is the blood pressure low, but you look at that parenthesis, that mean arterial pressure, it's now 45. You're not perfusing your organs. And so you need to do something about that. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, and uh, here is where I stop. Uh, just word of caution, uh, when you guys listen to this particular voiceover for the rest of this material, uh, and you'll see this in your slides, it starts at two minutes and nine seconds. I don't know what happened for that first couple of minutes, maybe two minutes and five seconds, but the first couple of minutes or so, you won't hear anything. But once you click on about, uh, about two minutes or so, you begin to hear me talking. So you go ahead and look up surgical management. I talked about that. I talked about uh, decreasing fatigue in my voiceover. I talk about how to prevent and manage pulmonary edema. So take a look at that. Remember the nitroglycerin dilates those blood vessels. And so the heart has to pump against less pressure. Uh, you're given Lasix to decrease that volume, the preload. So you have less uh, pulmonary congestion. The high fouls position, the higher you place them, the better they're able to breathe. Uh, you're assessing for early signs, for example, crackles in the basis, looking for dip, dips near at rest, disorientation and confusion. Um, IV morphine, for the anxiety, uh, the afterload, preload, and so forth, and continually assess. Then I want you to look at your care coordination and transition management. You must look at this information as well. Uh, there's some health teaching, see chart 35-4 for a list of assessment data that you need to glean uh, from this patient. Uh, we talk about worsening heart failure, increased weight gain, decreased activity uh, tolerance, cold symptoms, and so forth. So just take a look at that. Now we're talking about valve uh, heart disorders, mitral stenosis. Look at, look at your anatomy. When you're looking at these different uh, I, I talked about this in my voiceover, but make sure you look at your normal anatomy. You'll see where the mitral valve is located, where the, uh, where the mitral valve, as well as the, uh, the aortic valves are located. All right? So when we talk about stenosis, we're talking about a very narrow uh, opening in that valve, because the valve is, um, is incompetent. When we're talking about a regurge, it means the, the, the valve is uh, defective, so blood is going up, but it's going back. The mitral valve prolapse, meaning that valve is just, it just prolapses, it just falls. It's supposed to, it's supposed to uh, uh, open up uh, so that the ventr left ventricles can receive blood, but it just prolapses. It's just impaired. And so what, what all these have in common is with the stenosis and the mitral regurge, you're gonna be increasing your preload you're gonna increase your afterload in some cases, especially with the uh, stenosis, the aorta, aortic stenosis, and blood is backing up. So go, you'll go ahead and read about that information. I got all that for you. Uh, some of this assessment information, uh, take a look at that. Um, uh, read this information as well. I have a uh, voiceover with this as well. These are different heart, heart valves. Uh, coordination care and transition management, just read all that. So endo, in, in infective endocarditis, I uh, talked about that as well. So take a listen to that and also read your voiceover uh, notes, or my PowerPoint notes. 
Um, so look at this as well, your assessment data, diagnostic assessments. Uh, you have the non-surgical, which is your antibiotics. And you have your surgical management, so read this information as well. We talked about all this. Then we talk about pericarditis, read this as well. Um, yeah, so just listen to all this. All this is there for you. Your cardiomyopathy is another topic uh, we would have discussed in class. Uh, so listen to that as well. The treatments, surgical management, and also Raynaud's phenomenon, uh, listen to that as well. Anure aneurysms, uh, take a look at that. And that's it, actually. Uh, so as you can see, it would have been quite an undertaking to try to do this in class. It just couldn't be done. But I'm not going to leave you hanging. Uh, that's why I created the uh, voiceovers. If you don't want to listen to the voiceovers, just read the PowerPoints. I would, I would do both, personally. Uh, and of course, a combination of your reading as well. Um, if you neglect to read the PowerPoints, you probably won't do too well. Unless you're a really great reader, you comprehend the stuff, you probably won't do too well. But I would do both. A lot, of, a lot more reinforcement. Um, I will be communicating with you uh, via Outlook or announcements and whatnot. I'll keep you apprised to what to expect uh, for this exam. I promise I won't leave you hanging. Uh, we'll get you those focus, the focus sheets for the time being, study hard, and then I'll reward you with the, um, the focus sheets, which will help you even more. And make sure you do those drug classifications or drug cards or whatnot. Um, that should be very helpful to you also. Professor Barry, Yes. I have a question for Dr. Is this clarification on the remediation? So I know we can't go back in and, and repeat it because they said they can't do it. So in order to improve our grade, we can do the, some of the recommendation and that's going to boost it up to the 78? Well, the way, the way they're doing the remediation is, all right, say so you got 10 packets, right? And so each packet is worth 10%. So 10 times 10, that's, that's 100%. If you, got, if you got 78% on all those packets, then you get 100% on your grade. But let's say if you, um, if you drop, uh, if, if you didn't score 10% on at least three of them, now you have a 70%. You see that? So it kind of, it just drops a 10%. Each packet that you don't have over 70%, over 78%, it drops. So do we need to recommendations to boost it? Because some of those only have like two questions. So you missed one, that's your 50. Yeah, um, unfortunately. And you know what? That's the same thing with the HESI. You can miss um, any particular topic where it just gives you one, one question and you miss it and you 100% got that wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't like that, but that, that's the way it is. Uh, that's the way they have it. They may have two questions like you just said and then on, on the HESI, you get one right, you get the other one wrong, it shows that you got 50% of that category uh, right, which is, which is kind of jacked up, but yeah, that's the way it is. So we just need to the extra the recommendation, whatever recommended to boost that score back up? Is that what we have to do? You know, I was, I was trying to do it that way, but it appears that they're not allowing us to do it that way. I was trying to push for that. Um, so, so there's really no way to bring it back up then. Yeah, well, even if it doesn't bring you back up to over 78%, uh, you're not going to fail. You well, won't the fail the class. Or... The remediation. Remediation is not going to fail you. Uh, what it will do, what my concern would be, is if you don't remediate well, my question is, do you understand that material? Now, I'm going to tell you all something. That remediation, oh, excuse me, the, uh, the HESI you guys took you know what? I'm going to stop this recording.